Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis, a breaking news reporter here at Forbes. Joining me now is my Forbes colleague, reporter Matt Craig. Matt, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. It is week two of the Olympics, and you're reporting about the highest paid athletes competing in Paris, and you write this for Forbes. Quote, while the Paris Olympics are sure to produce a new set of heroes, the 2024 Summer Games are not likely to mint many new millionaires. Why not? Yeah, I mean, I, th I, I think it's this rare opportunity, and this is kind of what we love about the Olympics, is that uh, the world is watching these events often for the first time. I think that's part of the reason why we love watching it is we get to see water polo and artistic swimming, synchronized diving, and these, these kinds of things. However, um, after the games are over, a lot of times those sports kind of slink back into obscurity. Um, and one, one of the things that I found very interesting, I had a conversation with Michaela Schiffer and the, the downhill ski racer, um, and she, she hit this right on the head. You know, she was like, the Olympic moment is awesome, and it's kind of the culmination of your athletic career, but it doesn't necessarily last very long. And unless you're able to keep that spotlight, sometimes it's hard to turn that athletic performance into earnings. And so when we look at the highest paid athletes at the Olympics, it's not these Olympic heroes that we traditionally think of. It's really the professional athletes that Forbes tracks throughout the year um, who have these huge professional uh, sports contracts and then also make tons of money in endorsements. So in some ways it's, it's fairly obvious that it's the most famous athletes that get paid the most, um, but it's somewhat counterintuitive that it's not oftentimes the Olympic heroes that, uh, that end up getting paid. Can you go back to what Michaela Schifrin said about trying to make that Olympic moment last? And how do athletes do that to make it a larger payday? Because some of the most popular games to watch are gymnastics, are swimming. But as you're saying, that doesn't really necessarily translate into a bigger payday for these athletes. Yeah, well, I mean, there's no professional sports leagues, or at least not lucrative ones for a lot of those sports that you just mentioned. And there's only an Olympics every four years. So realistically, uh, you know, there's only maybe two, three Olympics you go to as an athlete. And that's, you know, if you're one of the all time greats um, and two or three moments in that that world spotlight. So the way I would think about it really for our professional athletes that we track throughout the year as well is that you get paid, you know, if you reach that cultural influencer status. Um, and it's difficult for Olympic athletes to do that. The ones that have, for example, like a Simone Biles, um, it came because one, she's one of the greatest Olympians ever over multiple Olympic cycles. But also I think that in 2021, the struggles that she had, you know, with the twisties and, and the mental health aspect of it really increased her profile and opened her up to uh, a wider spectrum of sponsors and increased her earnings, I, I think significantly. Um, and then obviously the fact that she came back and, and has been the dominant athlete once again, um, she, among those like Olympic, traditional Olympic sports, she's one of the highest paid. Uh, but to my point, you know, she's only getting about like a hundred thousand dollars from competition. That's according to our estimates, uh, and $7 million in endorsement money, which is uh, a significant am amount. Don't get me wrong. But you know, when you compare it to like LeBron James, um, isn't a ton. And there, there's one example of an Indian badminton player who's the same as we don't know her in the United States, but is a massive star in, in India, kind of culturally, right? A cultural influencer. So she's making, you know, $7 million in endorsements um, as well. Uh, but again, LeBron James, it's $128 million. So it's not even really, they're not even in the same ballpark uh, as each other. And that's just because LeBron is omnipresent in culture and and is every single year and really throughout the year not even just in basketball season you mentioned lebron james so let's get right to your list because you're reporting he's the only billionaire to be competing in the olympics and as a surprise to no one he does top the list as the highest paid olympian who who else is it when it comes to men's basketball yeah so if we were to just like do a straight objective ranking of all the highest paid athletes at the Olympics, say like top 200 or a hundred, we'll say um, the basketball category would be the highest by far because uh, NBA playing contracts have just gotten to that point. Also, I think because uh, for example, like the men's soccer players, it's 25 and under for the Olympics. So a lot of the 
huge stars are not there. Um, but yeah, these these NBA players, you know, they have they're pairing 30, 40, 50 million dollars in playing contracts, and they're also consistently um, the highest earners in endorsements. Just whenever we track our highest paid athletes, you know, in the world, um, huge shoe contracts. Also, they're just very well known, of course, as opposed to football, they're not playing behind helmets or things like that. So um, LeBron James and Steph Curry and Giannis, right, they're, they're being used to sell State Farm insurance or S Sprite or, you know, uh, categories that are not necessarily always tied to um, tied to sports. So yeah, Le LeBron James, uh, the first self-made billionaire that's uh, ever competed at the Olympics of course, like some um, children of billionaires, and therefore they are billionaires, uh, have done it, especially in sports like uh, equestrian or tennis, right? Um, but LeBron James, self-made billionaire, uh, competing, and in the past year, we've estimated that he's made around $128 million, which is no chump change. Um, Giannis Antetokounmpo and uh, Steph Curry, both over $100 million as well, uh, and really all the way down the line. The U.S. Ms. basketball team in particular, uh, they're making very, very good money. You're throwing numbers out here that are just astronomical for a salary, but traditionally, do these basketball players make more money in endorsements or that salary? At the very, very top end, um, you can always make more in endorsements because there's no cap, right? Uh, so if you're a LeBron James or you know, or Steph Curry or Giannis that I mentioned. Um, yeah, you can make more in endorsements, but uh, for the most part, in fact, I, I think uh, Giannis and LeBron are the only examples uh, this year where that is the case. Everyone else is making more uh, from these playing contracts because on the NBA side of things, right, they have a collective bargaining agreement that says 51% of all revenue gets has to go to the players, and that number has just continued to go up as media rights have ballooned to these you know billions of dollars a year. Um, figures and so even though there is a salary or a, a salary maximum like LeBron James is capped at uh, 20 uh, 30 percent I believe it is uh, of a team's salary cap that number has just gotten so so high that um, you know even even these here's a, an even better example these non team USA um, teams that are, are in the NBA uh, a lot of these teams have NBA players now like for example Canada they have 10 NBA players on their roster, and those players are making, on average, $16.2 million a year from their NBA playing contract. So it's not just the highest end, it's it's really depth throughout the league of, of players that are making, you know, I, I mentioned Simone Biles, seven million in endorsements, right? The 10th man on the Canadian basketball team is making, you know, average 16.2 million, maybe not exactly one-to-one uh, -one there, but um, yeah, the NBA players and the basketball players are the highest paid players at these Olympics by far. I mean, those numbers are just incredible, but now let's move down a little bit to men's and women's tennis. What's notable about those lists? I think specifically the women's tennis list is notable because one of the things that Forbes does is we rank the highest paid female athletes um, across all sports uh, throughout the year, not just Olympics. And consistently over the past decade, the female tennis players have been the highest paid uh, category of female athletes. And for a long time, it was Maria Sharapova, then Serena Williams had it, Naomi Osaka had it for two years. Um, and this past year, Iga Swiatek, $23.9 million. Um, again, compared to the highest end of the men, right? It's, it, it's still not um, there, but uh, it, when it comes to comparing to other female sports, um, yeah, the women's tennis players and Iga, she has a pretty impressive uh, sponsorship portfolio to go with the fact that she's a very, very consistent winner of uh, prize money. Obviously, in tennis, you, you kind of you, you eat what you kill um, at these tournaments, and you have to continue to earn it. Right behind her is is Coco Goff, who, again, is uh, is very young. I mean, Iga Schwantek is only 23 years old, right? But... Um, but uh, Coco Goff as well has really the prime years uh, of her career and her prime earning years um, ahead of her and is already making, you know, we, we estimate $21.7 million. Um, on the men's side, it's kind of the, the earnings kind of follow uh, the way the results have been. Novak Djokovic and Carlos Alcaraz have been, you know, the old guard, you know, the potential greatest of all time. And then this like new challenger, uh, we saw that in the Wimbledon final. 
We saw that in the gold medal tennis match um, just a couple of days ago as we're recording. They're also the two highest earners. Novak uh, makes around $38 million uh, last year, and Kalar Sagar has around $31 million. But I believe, and I, I think it's uh, a foregone conclusion, that uh, Alcaraz will be the highest paid tennis player um, for this upcoming year, whenever we, we do that list again before the US Open. Why do you have that premonition? Well, he's won the French Open this year, and he's won Wimbledon, so he has, he has those huge paydays. And also, um, Novak Djokovic has not, well, he won this gold medal. That was the first tournament that he'd won all year. So I would assume um, the sponsorships would be, you know, relatively the same. Maybe Alcaraz is gaining uh, in that category as well because, you know, he's young and he's exciting and he's winning. But I think primarily if you win a Grand Slam, it's, a you know, a couple million dollar check. And he's won two of them this year uh, and he's kind of been on fire. So I think... Uh, He's likely, likely to pass Novak Djokovic. We'll have to see whenever uh, whenever we finally put that list together. Matt, go back to the female list a bit for us. And can you talk to us about why women tennis players are consistently the highest paid female athletes on Forbes' list? Yeah, uh, I mean, for one thing, um, they're very visible. Um, uh, you know, they they're kind of, they're out there by themselves and women's tennis is a, a popular sport. I think when you think about um, the popularity between men's and women's, um, the, the female tennis players are, are very popular. One, also there's been a huge movement within tennis to have equal prize pools. Um, off the top of my head, I know the US Open has equal prize pools. I don't think every, every tournament does, but the, uh, the, the female prize pools um, have come up significantly in, in the past decade. And on top of that, you know, when you think about the top of that sport, um, there have been some athletes that have crossed over into that sort of cultural influencer status that I was talking about. You know, if you think about Maria Sharapova was doing uh, ads for Porsche and for beauty brands. And then obviously Serena Williams um, was, you know, <laughs> about as famous as, a, as an athlete could be. Uh, Naomi Osaka had huge, uh, huge endorsements in her home country of Japan. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think the female tennis players are the ones that we've seen that have crossed over into that mainstream appeal and really dipped into that well of, you know, huge endorsement dollars. Um, that has been tough. Uh, I think um, the women's soccer players were starting to get there, but then they retired. Like the uh, the Alex Morgans, she hasn't quite retired yet, but uh, uh, Megan Rapino and that kind of class, uh, Abby Wambach, they were, they were reaching that status, but kind of toward the, uh, the end of their careers. And um, when you think about, you know, this upcoming uh, sort of generation of female athletes, you know, of course, Caitlin Clark would come to mind. Um, she's not at these Olympic Games, so not not exactly sure um, there, but someone who's who's crossing over into that mainstream appeal. Absolutely. And I think you could say that about several of the female uh, basketball players. Um, so maybe maybe when we do this exercise four years from now, the next Olympics, we're talking about uh, the, the women's basketball players, but uh, for now, the tennis group is uh, by far and away um, highest earning uh, female athletes. You touched on women's soccer, so let's go there next. The highest paid women's soccer player on this list earns more than the second highest paid player and third highest paid player combined. You're reporting calling her the queen of Spanish soccer. Who is she? Yeah, that's uh, Alexia Putellis, and um, I think this is a perfect example of kind of uh, the explanation that I've been giving this whole time, because uh, Alexia Putellis not only won one, but two of the uh, Ballon d'Or, uh, the best player in the world uh, awards. And so you've got someone that's consistently uh, been in that spotlight you know, as being the best in the world, and because of that has built up this uh, large, you know, endorsement uh, portfolio. We had estimate that she has 10 long-term endorsement deals um, to go with whatever contracts that she has with her club and with her national team. And so really she's, you know, the, um, the, the biggest uh, star, you know, like sport aside, you know, she's on, on the older end, she's had some knee surgeries, but the biggest celebrity, I guess I should say, uh, and because of that, you know, she's being paid like that. Again, if Megan Rapinoe had been here, if, uh, if Alex Morgan had been here, they would probably have numbers uh, up in that league. Um, below Alexei Putellis on the women's soccer side, it's just 
uh, uh, several U.S. women's national team players, and their earnings are, depend heavily upon how many appearances with the national team they have in a given year because they get paid on a, a per game basis for that. Um, but the two that, that are mentioned in the article, Trinity Rodman and Sophia Smith, um, I don't know that like too many average sports fans uh, would know their face and know their name yet. Now, they may have huge Olympic moments here. Uh, you know, the U.S. women's national team is, is still moving through the, uh, the medal rounds um, of their competition. So maybe these, these players can transcend. But as of now, they're not celebrities in their own right. You know, they're, they're just uh, highly paid um, professional athletes. So in order to reach that next threshold, you know, they would have to, uh, to kind of step into mainstream stardom. And maybe we'll be talking about them when we do this again in four years. But I do want to finish out the conversation with talking about men's and women's golf. You're reporting that John Rahm had the highest earning year of any golfer Forbes has ever recorded. How was he able to pull this off? Yeah, you can't talk about um, the golf scene without mentioning Saudi Arabia, right? Uh, John Rahm yeah, highest, will be the highest earning um, player in the past year that's competing at these Olympics solely because he um, switched over from the PGA Tour to the Live Golf Tour, the, which is backed by the Saudi Arabian uh, Public Investment Fund. And uh, we estimate that he received about half of his announced $350 million dollar um, deal with them up front as kind of uh, you know a lump sum, and so if we factor that in with the prize money he'd already earned from tournaments of the past year, and then the endorsements they had previously, um, which uh, you know many of them will drop off with him joining the Live Golf Tour, but not that that matters when you're receiving a 175 million dollar check. Um, but uh, but yeah yeah he has the highest earning year. Uh, highest earning year of any golfer ever, more than Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods had many years over a hundred million um, from endorsements. And who knows if we were to adjust that for inflation, but in this new, you know, uh, live golf, Saudi Arabian uh, influenced environment, uh, it, we're seeing numbers that we've never seen before. Um, the only other thing I'll mention on the men's golf side is that uh, the PGA tour players behind John Rahm. So Rory McIlroy, Scotty Scheffler, um, they are also seeing increased earnings because of the Live Golf Tour. So basically, in order to um, try to keep their players from all jumping over to the Live Golf Tour, the PGA Tour has had to uh, add incentives and, and increase their prize money um, in order to yeah to try and um, compete with the the, the new disruption uh, from Live. And because of that, Rory McIlroy and Scotty Scheffler are also making um, more money than they have previously. Just to put numbers on that. Roy McIlroy around $83 million from both prize money and endorsements and Scotty Scheffler, uh, $61 million according to restaurants. Matt, you've done a lot of highest paid athletes lists. And when you're looking at them, does performance directly translate to financial success or do you need, you know, that full package star power to really elevate yourself to that next threshold financially? Um, I, I mean, those are, two things that are hard to separate from each other. I think uh, having elite performance puts you on those stages that have a lot of eyeballs. Um, and so, yeah, you, you, there is definitely like a, a baseline of accomplishment that is needed um, for you to, you know, be someone that a brand would want to work with. Like brands basically endorse with athletes because they want the association with greatness, you know? And so if you're, uh, not one of the best in the world, then you're not very valuable to a brand. Um, however, I would say that uh, being, you know, this, again, this cultural influencer, this celebrity, this star um, is more important, you know, to landing bigger deals than being consistently the best. I, I guess just to go back to the uh, group that we were just talking about, Scotty Scheffler has been um, the best player hands down in golf over the past year, you know, winning just majors tournaments setting records um and he even had like the most uh prize money earnings in pga tour history um last year but rory mcelroy is more famous he is a, a bigger star a bigger celebrity people know his face people know his name and because of that you know he's doing bigger deals uh, he's, he's getting more endorsements he has more business uh, irons in the fire and so that's that's a perfect example uh, where you know Roy McIlroy is still one of the best in the world can still be associated with that competitive greatness, um, but once you get up to that level, 
Uh, it is a little bit about, you know, your, your public perception, your personality, uh, your Q rating, right? How many, how much people like you. Um, and that allows you to, to kind of land those mega deals. Matt Craig, per usual, I appreciate the conversation. Thanks for your reporting. Thanks for having me, Brittany.